So Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 10, when you're there, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, I like that. And Judah said, the strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish so that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said, they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, from all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Therefore said I in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. And here it is right here. And fight for your brethren, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your houses. I said, fight for your family. Fight for your family. Now, we may not be under a physical attack like they were in this day. They were facing both a physical and a spiritual attack. But we most definitely are under a spiritual attack within our families. The battle is on against the family like never before. And we need to be ready for that. And that's why we need to understand these principles because Satan is seeking to destroy our families. He's seeking to destroy what even a family is. We don't know what a family is anymore. We have no idea what a family is today. It's anything we want it to be. Well, my dad was my dad, you know, five years ago, but now he's my second mom. We don't know what a family is. We're so confused and lost on that. Men don't know if they're men. Women don't know if they're women. And if they do know that they're a man or a woman, they don't know what their role is. And they've got it all out of whack. And it's destroying our homes because we don't know. Look, you can see as you go back, you look in the book of Acts, you look in history, and you see that Satan tried to destroy the churches, the Lord's churches from without. He tried to. He put persecution against them. But as the saying goes, you know, the, the, the blood of the saints is the... Uh, I forget how it goes now, now that I wanted to say it. Uh, but the blood of the saints is what waters the, the, the church and it's what spreads it, basically. That's what feeds it and helps it to grow. The persecution from without only spread Christianity is my point. It helped it to grow. It spread people out preaching the word in other places as they're running for their life. That's what it did. So he tried to destroy it from without. He said, that's not working. And he still will. He's not opposed to that 100%. I mean, it'll come back. But rather what he sought to do instead, he said, I may have to be more patient, but let me try and destroy it from within. Now, that takes more time, but that's exactly what he did, and that's how the message this morning, you know you've got a harlot church and her children. A harlot church and her children, all these false churches. So you're saying, Pastor, are you saying then that, that you know 95 plus percent of the churches in America aren't true churches? That's exactly what I'm saying. Amen. That's exactly what I'm saying. Why? Because they don't follow doctrine. Amen. So you think you're better than them. No, I do not. I would like for them to come along Amen. and follow truth. That's what I want. That's what I desire. But Satan did a very good job at destroying churches from within. He went in and he started planting false doctrine, false teaching, false truth. And he's done the same thing within our families. And it's destroyed the family. It's absolutely destroyed it. If he can break down the setup of authority that he's designed, it's done. It is done. If he can get the children against the parents and the wife against the husband, and the husband not to follow God, if he can just get one of those, it's success. Success. He's going to harm that family. Can I say, obviously for all of us, the greatest thing every one of us as individuals needs is we need to submit to the Lord and follow Him. That's just a given, okay? But second to that, the greatest danger that he can place in a family is for a wife not to follow her husband. Amen. Period. Even if he's lost. Even if he's lost. Now let me put in a, you know, a, a little side note on that here if I can. Parentheses on that. You follow that lost man until he does not until he is going to have you do something against the Bible. That's when you have permission from God to depart from what he says. 
But as long as everything he's asking you to do isn't unbiblical and isn't sinful, you stay following him. So I don't agree with it. Stay following him. God says when you do that, you're showing your submission to him. You're showing your, when you submit to your husband, you're showing your submission to the Lord. You're saying, okay, I don't get this, God, but I, I'm trusting you. <laughs> so I'll do it. But that's the number one place. If God can break that relationship down, if God can undermine that relationship, if God can start chipping away at that foundation, the whole family's done. Done. Yes, I get it. Apart from the grace of God, He can save and restore any of us. I get that. But for the most part, we know, just experience tells us that's not the case. That doesn't happen. It destroys the whole family. That's what it does. So he sought to do it from within, within churches, and he's doing the same thing within our families. That's why we need to understand that that's how he's going to attack. I liked what Brother Fox said when he was up here. He said, after we had that revival, we were at each other's throats. And he said, we didn't know why. We were just, man, kids are griping at each other. They're griping at us. We're griping at them. We're, me and my wife are gri griping at each other. And he realized all, he said, wait a minute, why are we like this? And he realized it was a spiritual attack. And because he recognized that, he pulled back and he took some necessary action. And that's what we need to do. That's what this is for us. It's, it's a kind of a wake-up call to say, wait a minute, are we, are we off base in some places? Are there some things we need to maybe move over and get, get in line with the Word of God and change some things and, and shore these things up and protect ourselves better and maybe be more vigilant about what's going on? That's what this is about right here. It's not to hurt anybody's feelings. It's not to pick at anyone, but it's to help us. So we've gone through these... Ten principles. We're on number nine now. I'm just going to quickly read through the first eight. So we need to teach our children that the Bible is the inspired Word of God and our final authority. Number two, my purpose in life is to seek God with my whole heart and to build my goals around His priorities. Number three, my body is the living temple of God and must not be defiled by the lusts of the flesh. Number four, my church must teach the foundational truths of Scripture and reinforce my convictions, which are based on the Bible. Number five, my children and grandchildren belong to God, and it is my responsibility to teach them scriptural principles, godly character, and basic convictions. Number six, my activities must never weaken the scriptural convictions of another Christian. Number seven, my marriage is a lifelong commitment to God and to my marriage partner. Number eight, my money is a trust from God and must be earned and managed according to scriptural principles. And now a new one, number nine, my words must be in harmony with scripture, especially when reproving and restoring a Christian brother. Our words need to be in harmony with scripture. Let's, if we would, turn to Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 28. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 28. It says there, The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. So if we are going to have our words be in harmony with Scripture and reprove somebody we're talking about within our family. It can go beyond that, though. Anybody we're talking to, if we have to reprove them, maybe bring some correction into their life, then what we ought to do is follow what Proverbs 15, 28 says, and the heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. See, we don't want to have the mouth of the wicked pour out evil things, something that's going to, to be hurtful. Now, what we have to say to someone may be hurtful, but there's a right way to say it. And that's why the heart of the righteous studieth to answer. We need to study and pray about how's the best way I can approach them with this, with this news. And I'm so guilty of not doing this with my children. But we need to. With all of our family, with anybody we come in contact with. Because we'll get so comfortable. And I, can I say especially dads, we're the authority in the home, so it's just... You know, hey, do what I say. I'm your father. You need to obey me. So we don't always study to answer. So we're really pouring out the mouth of a wicked person. Because we don't stop and think about how can I word this to my child, my wife, where I don't unnecessarily hurt their feelings. And we need to do that. We have to do that. Unless we want, you know, Satan chipping at our foundation of our family. And bringing in division there, hurting feelings. 
I mean, is there a parent in here that doesn't have regrets? I, I have a ton of regrets. I wish I didn't. I wish I did. I mean, more than I can count. Let's go to Proverbs 25, 11, if we would, please. As we study to answer, Proverbs 25, 11 says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Man, it just makes it nice. If we can say the right words, it just, it's so fitting. And it's perfect. So it says it's like apples of gold and pictures of silver. I don't know about you guys, but when I see gold and silver together, they just fit good together. It does. It looks, it can look very classy, very sharp. And that's what it's saying right here. It just fits right when we say the right words. When we're kind in how we speak to each other. I mean, you can say something. Hey, go pick up the trash. Or, hey, would you please pick up the trash? There's a difference. Well, you said the same thing. But it's how you say it. Amen. Me too. Me too. Colossians 4, 6 says that let our speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that we may know how we ought to answer every man. Now, specifically, the context of that is speaking about sharing the gospel. But it fits just the same that our speech should be with grace and seasoned with salt. We should. You don't want to over season something. With salt, you ever eat, you're like, ah, you won't even eat it. You'll push it away. That's too gross. I don't want that. But you just season it lightly, and you're like, that tastes good. That's good. And that's how our speech should be, especially towards our family. Especially towards our family. Towards our brothers and sisters, towards our parents, towards our children, towards our spouses. We should especially work at this. Because we get so comfortable with those people, we're most likely to be rude and mean to them. So we have to consciously make a decision to not be that way. That's why it'd be good as a family to get some of these verses and memorize them. Just sit down as a family and say, we're going to, let's memorize this verse together and just spend time, even if it's just two minutes a day, just going over a verse. In that two minutes, you're meditating on that, you're thinking about it. I mean, just, I mean, it could be Proverbs 25, 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. I bet in two minutes, probably every one of us in here could memorize that. And then if we just review it every day, it'd just be a reminder to us, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. That word fitly spoken, I need to watch what I say. I need to make sure what I say just, just fits where it should. You know, and it's not just like a punch in the face. Bam! I'm going to make it fit. Let me just jab this in there as hard as I can. No, how about I just look for the spot and I'm like, ah. Just sucks it right in. You're like, ah, that fits perfect right there. See, that's how our speech should be. But we won't naturally do that. Naturally, we're just going to say what we want to say. So we have to train ourselves to say the right thing. Let's go one more time to Galatians 6.1. Another place. We're looking at this. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 1. Galatians 6, 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault... Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So he's talking to members of the churches of Galatia, in this region in Galatia. He's writing this letter to them, and he's saying, Brethren, we're all saved here. If a man be overtaken in a fault, people are going to fall. People are going to do wrong. People are going to go down. So when that happens... When we have a brother that's overtaken in a fault, a sister that's overtaken in a fault, he says, ye which are spiritual. Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. You see what the unspiritual person does is start attacking that person. I knew it. I knew it. Look, the spiritual person may have recognized that too and said, I saw that coming. But how can I help him now? See, the unspiritual person is just going to go after him isn't going to seek to build them back up, but will maybe be like, I told you so. should have listened to me. 
And I'm not saying there's not a, a, a case for that. There's not a time when that needs to be said, maybe. But usually not. Usually not. If a man be overtaken in a fault, it's not like this person was just running after sin. That's not what it's implying right here. It's not saying, I just love sin and wanted to, wanted to do it. I don't care what you say, I'm going after it. No, he was overtaken in it. He was overtaken in it. He was maybe fighting against it, but it just, it just caught him. It just caught up to him. Like you ever been out in the ocean maybe, and you're just out there playing in the waves, and then all of a sudden those waves, they're getting bigger and bigger, and you're like, I didn't intend to get sucked up in this, and they pulled me out farther and farther, I'm overtaken. I didn't mean to go that far. Right. Well, you, someone, the, the unspiritual person will say, they shouldn't have been doing that in the first place. You're right, they shouldn't have been doing that in the first place. But what's in your life you shouldn't be doing in the first place? What's in here that nobody sees? What's in here that nobody sees? So they were overtaken. Yeah, they shouldn't have been doing it. You're right, they shouldn't have. But they did, and they were overtaken. So now the spiritual person needs to help restore them. And that's what we need to do in our families. We need to help our children when they do wrong. We have to teach them that's sin. Here's how you walked into that. You didn't see it because of this. Look for this next time. Restore them. Help them to see the truth. Teach them discernment. Teach them how to have discernment, what it means. Here's, I mean, honestly, it's going to mean, hey, you did this, you sinned, you did wrong. Here's what you should look for next time so you don't do that. Restore such an one, it says, in the spirit of meekness. You know, let me get you the definition for it. I could say it, but I'd miss some of it. Meekness is a softness of temper. That means you don't fly off the handle. Guilty. You don't fly off the handle. You have a softness of temper, mildness, gentleness. You're gentle. This is how we're to restore someone. Not jumping down their throat. That's not how we do it. It also means forbearance under injuries and provocations. That means if someone's done you wrong. Injuries. They pro they're provoking you. How dare they? But they need restoration. Restore them. Restore them. See, especially as we talk about this church right here, they're a member of this body. You want them restored. And man, if your kidneys stop working, you're going to be in a lot of pain, most likely. Any vital organ you have, you know, you get a kidney stone or something like that. It is not working like it should. Something is wrong here. We could look at that like a brethren overtaken in a fault. It hurts all of us. And you're in pain and it hurts and we don't like it. But man, we sure do want that kidney restored, don't we? So that everything's just flowing back how it should be. I want my body working the way it's supposed to. I've thrown my back out before. The first time I did it was the worst time. Maybe the second worst time. There might have been another tie in there. But the first time I did it, I didn't realize some guy was on the side of uh, driving down 2nd Street and he had a bunch of plywood fall out of his truck. And he was there in the middle of the street on 2nd Street and I jumped out to help him. And I went and I just, we just picked it up and I just leaned over and picked it up and I didn't, I kind of felt something in my back, but not really. I just picked it up. And I was like probably 22 years old. So I'm like, I can do anything. I'm invincible, right? So I just pick it up and I just put it in his truck. And the next morning I woke up and I couldn't even move out of bed. My whole back hurt. I, I couldn't lift my, I mean, nothing. I my, hurt to move my arms. I mean, my wife wanted to help me. She was like, what can I do? I was like, no, I couldn't even breathe. It hurt to breathe. I mean, I, I've literally rolled out of bed and fell on the floor. It took me, I don't know, like 30 minutes to get standing up. I literally like rolled out of the bed and fell on the floor and like just slowly like crawled up on all fours. And that w was painful, painful. Finally got up. So I'm just on my hands and my knees. And the hardest part was getting from there to, to over to the bed. I mean, picture I'm in pain like like this. And I'm trying to get myself to, to pull myself up on the bed so I can finally stop supporting my back. So my, I can just lay there and have my back at least supported. And I got to that. And then I 
from there, I was able to slowly push myself up. And she's like, can I help you? And I was like, don't touch me. Just, I, don't touch me. It hurts. I didn't want her touching me. I mean, and I finally got where I was standing up. And I said, after that, I, I healed. It took like three or four days. I got better. And after that, I said, I never realized how much you use your back muscles. I couldn't do anything. I was worthless. She's come home before. I'm there laying on the kitchen floor. Bring all, oh, because it hurts to breathe. And I'm just laying there, and she's like, what, have you hurt your back again? I was like, yeah, she already knows now. But I couldn't wait for it to get better. I couldn't wait for restoration. And that's how it should be when somebody within here that's a member of this church, because they're a part of this body, when they're overtaken in a fault and they fall, we ought to restore them in the spirit of meekness. And it says something else. It says, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So when we say, oh, not me. That wouldn't happen to me. God says you better consider yourself, lest thou also be tempted. And then you take it a little bit down to verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So we need to take this to heart when we're restoring maybe a situation in our family with our children. Parents, you better be willing to suck down some humble pie as often as needed to admit you're wrong, to go to your children and say, I was wrong. Please forgive me. The way I yelled at you, I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? And just take the blame because it is your fault. Don't be a blame shifter. Don't say it's someone else's. I, oh, my parents raised me this way. So what? You've got the Bible. You know what God expects. So what? Stop making excuses for why you're doing wrong and start doing right. That's what needs to happen. Don't make excuses for it. Admit, admit you're wrong and fix it. That's what we need to do. Consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. All right, number 10. My affections must be set on things above, not on things on the earth. Go to, let's go to our memory verse, if we would. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Set our affections on things above, not on things on this earth. We need to teach our children this. We need to teach ourselves this. It's easy to get focused on the things of this world. The Bible says, if ye then be risen with Christ, if we're risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. You know, our baptism pictures our death to our flesh. Do you know that? It's saying I'm dead to myself. And I'm alive unto Christ. So then, if ye then be risen with Christ. What's that? When I've submitted to Him in biblical baptism, Amen. I am risen with Christ. It's a submission from my heart to Him. It's saying, I'm dead to me, and I'm alive unto you. God, what do you want from me? So then, if ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. See, remember, Christ is up there. He's ruling and reigning. No matter what's happening here, Christ is in charge. Christ... Nothing surprises him. He's not worried about anything. He's not worried about things going on in our government, things going on uh, uh, where, wherever it may be around the world. He's not worried about that. He's on his throne. He's where he needs to be, and he knows, I know everything that's going to happen. Don't worry about it. So we need to seek those things that are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And as we do that, we set our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. See, we have to teach our children to... Stop focusing on the things of this earth. We have to teach them that, that this isn't important. Stop valuing what the world says is valuable. Stop valuing it. And it's attractive. It looks good. Man, I see a, a new car. I'm like, that's nice. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we're setting our affections, I'm working towards that. I want to get a new car. Most teenage boys I know, they want a, a fast sports car. Or a, a big four by four, something like that, or a low rider, something. But I mean, hey, that's a lot of my friends. That's what they wanted. You know, I, I'll take any one of those, just so you know. All right, but we see, we can see those things, and that's what we want. So we set our affections on that, and we work towards that, and we give everything towards that. I mean, I knew so many silly people in high school that they'd have the biggest junker car and they'd spend, the car's 500 bucks, and they spend $2,000 on rims, $4,000 on a stereo. I'm like, you're a fool. You're a fool. What are you doing? 
But I mean, I knew all kinds of people like that. And then they're like, oh, my rims got stolen. Well, good, they didn't fit that ugly car anyway. No. But see, we teach people to, to value the things of this earth, and we, the world's going to teach us that. If we just let media tell us and we follow advertising, then we're going to value the things of this earth. See, the world tells us that you need to focus on your looks and you need to change your looks and you're not pretty enough and you're not this, your body doesn't look right and you need to do all these different things. You know what that is? That's discontentment. Amen. We're not content. And God says that we're to be content with such things as He have. But when we want to change everything about us, we're like, I don't like this about me, I don't like that about me. You know what that is? We're not happy with what God made us to be. And that, by the way, that falls right in line, that same thing about us and us wanting to maybe change our physical appearance. And there's nothing wrong, by the way, with wanting to, to look handsome or look pretty or anything like that. There's nothing wrong with those things. But if that's our focus and we're setting all our attention on that, there's a problem. Amen. And the world's going to tell you to set all your attention on that. Amen. And that's not how it should be. We should be content with what we are. But if we're falling into that trap, that's no different. We're, we're not happy with how God made us. That's no different than the transgender that says, I'm not happy how God made me. I'm actually supposed to be a woman. Yeah. There's no difference. One may be more extreme than the other, but there's no difference. Because the baseline is, I'm not happy with how God made me. And I want to be something different. But because we're teaching our children, hey, value the things of this world. Let the media teach you what's important rather than God. Then our children aren't valuing the things of the Lord and they're valuing the things of this world. The world follows after vanity. It follows after looks and those will go away as you get older. Don't care who you are. I mean, you can make your face as tight as you want. You just look like a freak. Okay, that's all that ends up happening there. I mean, yeah, all that, you know, I want my lips bigger. and Okay. But your looks will go away. You know it. Money, the Bible says if you're going to chase after money, it takes flight like birds. It gets, grows wings and just flies away. Fleshly pleasures. The Bible says the end of that is death. All the things the world says to go after are vanity. Vain, it's empty. There's nothing in it. That's why we're to set our affection on things above. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves don't break through and steal. Get your heart off of those things. Look, I'm not preaching against having nice things either. Man, get a new car. Get a nice house. That's fine. But you better make sure God's number one in your life. I mean, if God says, hey, don't get that. I'd rather have you do this. You better be willing to follow him in that. What's more important? I got to remodel my house or give to missions. I don't know. You decide. Are our affections set on things above or things on this earth? On things that are going to burn up. Any of you ever been given, ever had like a good lump of money? Maybe, I don't know, to me, a good lump of money is like 50 bucks. But No, I'm kidding. Like a thousand, two thousand dollars, you know, you ever had a good lump of money like that? And you're like, oh, man, I can go get something with this. And, I mean, at the end of it, the money's gone. And you're like, what did I actually get with that? And nothing. Or it's sitting in the garage. And you never use it. But you had to have it. Man, I got to get this outfit. You don't understand. I mean, this shirt is so cute. And then you didn't get it, and your life fell apart, right? It was ruined. I mean, you were like a laughing stock, and everyone at school looked at you, and they were like, ha, ha, I can't believe you're not wearing that shirt. No, that didn't happen, did it? It didn't happen. No. Oh, I got to have that car. I mean, that's the thing for guys in high school. I got to get that car, man. I need to have a cool car. I have to. And you didn't get it, and guess what? You, like, survived. You know, you got that little four-cylinder that your dad says, well, this is more economical. You don't need that sports car. And you're like, I don't want it economical. That's stupid. You know, you're like, I don't want that. You know, I want a V8 that's going to, you know, get eight miles a gallon. That's what I want. But you made it through high school. You lived, you know, you weren't a laughing stock. 
And now you're like, oh, this is great. Now that I'm paying my own bills, I'm so glad that I have this little four-cylinder car that gets 30 miles a gallon. Because it didn't ruin your life. So stop setting our affections on things on the earth. And set them on things above. See, if we can teach our children now when they're young to give to the Lord, it won't be hard when they're older. You know, when they get a little allowance of $5 and you teach them, you give God 50 cents of that. Then when they make, you know, five, ten thousand a month, whatever it is, I don't know. It's not going to be hard for them to say, okay, God, here's 500. Here's a thousand. It won't be hard for them. Because you've taught them to value what's really important, what really matters. And I know that you guys don't think that here, but I still want to just remind us, if you think that's <laughs> that I'm just trying to get more money, then that's not it at all. We need to set our affections on things above, things that the Lord values, things the Lord says are important. So those are those ten scriptural principles. And now, I will not start on this. We will look at this next week. <clears throat> but having a Christ-centered or a child-centered home. Now, I told you as we came into this, none of this is going to be easy for any of us. This one's not going to be either. I mean, I, as I'm studying this, I'm just like, oh, man. You know, I'm just getting smacked between the eyes, just left and right with this stuff. Even in my own life. That selfishness reigns in each and every one of us. It reigns and rules. That's why we have to be dead to self and alive unto Christ. So as we get into this, it's, it's going to hit home. I'm just, I just want us to know it's going to hit home whether we have a Christ-centered or a child-centered home. And it's going to hit with every one of us. Every one of us is going to have things we have to work on. And the challenge before us is, are we willing to make those changes? Will we do that? I hope we're willing to do that. I hope we're willing to submit to the Lord as He leads us. I want to say one last thing as well. If, if you're here and you don't know the Lord is your Savior, you know, Brother Brad prayed for our children you know, they hear this all the time. But if you're here and you don't know the Lord is your Savior, you need to submit to Him. That's that repentance. You need to come to God on His terms and receive the free gift of salvation that He offers. He'll give you eternal life. And what a promise that is. That's amazing to me. God will give us eternal life when we're wretches that don't deserve it. He says, I love you anyway. And He'll give us complete forgiveness. If you'll just reach out and receive it, it's there for you. So as we take this time and pray, we have this invitation, and you say, I don't know the Lord is my Savior. You just come up, talk to me. I'll take a Bible. I'll show you how you can know. I'll talk to you about whatever you want. You can call out to the Lord right where you're at. Say, Lord, save me. God, I don't want to go to hell. Forgive me. If you've done that, come tell me. Let me know. I'd like to rejoice with you. I really would. Even if you say, everybody thinks I'm saved already. Who cares? I'll rejoice with you. They'll be rejoicing in heaven. Amen. Amen. We, we want to rejoice here. Amen. So if you don't know the Lord is your Savior, take care of that today. Christians, if there's things in your home you need to fix, maybe you've had the wrong attitude. Maybe you've been focused on all the things here. And it's been all about you. Maybe you need to come broken before God and ask for forgiveness and say, Lord, help set my heart on things above. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much.